Okay. So, uh, well, let's talk about the tail end of fatigue. So, fatigue. Resisting the urge to make more fatigue jokes here. I'm sure you're all very fatigued. Overall distress. Um, sorry, I had to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so yesterday we talked about <coughs> SN curves. So, SN curves, uh, which is also the sometimes called the, the stress life of the material. And we showed two types of plots with these SN curves. So one, one was on a semi-log and one was on a log-log plot. Um, but both of them kind of had the same form where we plotted some NF, which is cycles to failure. Uh, and some SA, or stress amplitude, because it's the, the amplitude of the stress that's actually going to be causing fatigue in most, particularly metal samples. Okay. Um, there was two kind of plots that I had shown. Um, both, so this NF was generally on a log scale. Uh, we'll start here at something like 10 to the three, Four, five, seven, ten to the four, ten to the five, six, ten to the seven, and we said uh, above, generally above the yield stress of the material, you'll have low cycle fatigue um, because you're plastically deforming your material. Uh, when you're in the elastic, elastic unquote regime, um, you get a phenomenon known as high cycle fatigue. So there's actually a difference in slope depending on whether you're in high or low cycle. Most of the time when people talk about fatigue, they're talking about high cycle fatigue. Um, and specifically, they, they plot two things. One is, one looks something like this, and one looks something like this. Oh, this kind of just keeps curving down. Um, so this one, I would get a whole bunch of points by applying different stress amplitudes and waiting to see how long it took my parts to fail. This would look something like a steel, S E E, uh, where there'd be some gradual decrease with a slope here, B, and we saw that B slope was roughly negative uh, 0.1 for most materials, uh, and then for steels specifically, um, or some other uh, some other FCC metals, you get an endurance limit. There's the word, SE, uh, endurance limit. Uh, and so basically that's around 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th, um, that's around a million or 10 million cycles, load cycles. Uh, the material for steel, the strength won't degrade anymore, and you'll be able to kind of reach a, a stable failure strength. Um, and so we call that the endurance limit of the material. The material is like aluminum, so this again has some number of points going down, uh, but there's not actually an endurance limit, it just kind of continues to degrade. <coughs> so this would be something like aluminum. Um, there was two different forms of, of this SN equation in the high strain life that we showed. Um, I'm going to show this again as a slope B. Um, I'm, there's only one you really need to know, um, and that's your stress amplitude or, or stress amplitude, um, where S again is the nominal stress, which just depends on geometry. Uh, is some sigma f prime to n f to the b, or you can write this in a different form as a n f to the b, capital B, uh, where then sigma f prime is equal to a over 2 to the b, where again b is around negative 0 0.1 for most metals. Um, 
which is generally what we're concerned about with fatigue here. So there's a couple things that I had said. So this, this one equation is kind of the, the one that you need to know for how materials degrade with time. It roughly scales with a negative one exponent with number of cycles. So um, you can just kind of see how it degrades. And then you need to know that steel will have an steel and some other metals will have an endurance limit and aluminum and lots of other metals don't and they'll just kind of continue to, to drop off so we had said or i'd said yesterday we defined sigma a was our stress amplitude amplitude and sigma m was our mean stress and we had said that these types of curves were generally generated for a mean stress of zero. So that means I'm going to plus sigma, minus sigma, and then kind of oscillating between those two. So I'm staying, my average stress is zero, and I'm cycling around that point. So then the question is what happens when that sigma m isn't zero? And that's again what most of these plots are derived using. So let's jump to another piece of paper. So the effect of varying the mean stress. Effect, I can spell things. Effect of varying mean stress sigma m. Okay, so now I'm going to show a slightly different plot here. This will be a plot of stress amplitude, sigma A against mean stress, sigma M. And I'll say here there's some zero. Um, out here there's an ultimate stress. So I know if my so as my as my amplitude goes up, this means the the distant the difference between my max and my min is increasing. So here at zero stress amplitude, um, I basically have a constant stress. So if my constant stress is zero, or if, if my amplitude is zero, meaning I have a constant stress, and my mean stress is uh, is the ultimate stress, then failure happens. So I have a point right there where my where I have no amplitude and my mean stress is, is my ultimate stress of the material or ultimate strength of the material. Along the zero point here, we have basically we're looking now, we can look for different stress amplitudes at different values of n. So if I have a low value of n, or yeah, if I have a low value of n, I have a high failure strength. Um, and as I increase my number of cycles to failure, that'll start to decrease. And so what this trend ends up looking like, if you start testing these uh, to failure at different mean stresses with different cycles to failure, um, you start getting something that looks kind of like this, where this would be my cycles to failure something like 10 to the fourth. Um, this goes in. This goes in. Again. So here, this would be 10 to the fifth. Uh, let's draw these out here. 10 to the sixth, 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth. So as, as I'm approaching my, my higher and higher stresses, or higher and higher numbers of cycles to failure, um, that failure stress starts to occur, it starts to kind of converge and get closer and closer. Um, but out here, they're kind of generally points along this graph um, if you were to look at this experimentally. And all of them kind of converge here at this 
ultimate at this uh, at the ultimate stress of zero or mean stress of the ultimate stress and zero amplitude. So I can redraw this by actually normalizing all of these by their strength to failure at that r equals zero or at that uh, the mean stress equals zero. So I'm going to define a parameter sigma a r is the stress amplitude to failure for sigma m is equal to zero. And so now I can plot this slightly differently and instead show just mean stress again. Here I'm going to plot my sigma a divided by sigma a r. So if I divide that by sigma a r, or if I divide my, my stress amplitude by the amplitude to failure, all of these points I'm normalizing by the value I'm getting there. So I get a single point in space by definition. Um, and what ends up happening, I still have my ultimate stress, um, is something like this. I'm going to plot this one. Dash line, bring out like that. And so all of these points actually kind of fall. Ooh. Nope. Uh, this is going to be. I'm going to redraw this slightly. There's still a sigma u, sigma f, b, tilde. There we go. This is what I want. Uh, this is supposed to be a straight line. It doesn't look very straight. Um, what ends up happening is all of my points kind of start to fall along a particular line here that actually slightly undershoot or slightly overshoots my sigma u um, if I normalize by by this stress amplitude. And so all of them collapse onto this line. Um, but there's a relationship now called the Goodman relationship. So Goodman relationship that states if I take that sigma a divided by sigma a r um, and I plot it now against uh, sigma m over sigma u then that has to be equal to 1. So that's basically plotting this dashed line here. So this is now, if my mean stress is my ultimate stress, um, I basically can't have any stress amplitude, otherwise it'll cause failure. So failure happens when that condition is true. Um, There we go. So now, again, if my mean stress is my ultimate stress, basically I'm plotting this point here, my stress amplitude has to be zero. Um, if my mean stress is zero, then this term goes to zero, my stress amplitude can be that AR value. Um, and then everything else kind of falls along this dashed line here. So this is a conservative kind of lower bound on, on estimating how many uh, what what stress amplitude I can give, given a certain mean stress sigma m. Uh, a more accurate one is basically if you if you plot these out and figure out where that intercept is, uh, you can actually get that sigma a over sigma a r plus sigma m over this weird symbol. Um, this is kind of the actual. If you, if you just did a linear fit to this thing, uh, this is what your bound would be. But because there's some noise around these points, 
and not all of them lie exactly on that line. The Goodman relationship is generally used because it's a safe bound. Um, so this is how changing your mean stress will affect what you what your safe stress amplitude is to failure. Yeah. Uh, that's just where this point intercepts. I don't know if it has any physical meaning. I think it's just like if you if you plotted all this data out and you fit where that intercept was where that intercept of the x-axis, that would be that FB sigma failure B stress. There's there's a name for it. I can't actually remember it. Yeah, sigma u. Sorry, this is ultimate stress. U. Yeah, so the same u is here. Yeah. Um, but they should theoretically all converge to this point here. Um, they just don't necessarily. Actually, if you if you fit out the straight line. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe. Or fine enough, I guess. Okay. Um, so now, so far, we've only been looking at basically if I if I'm applying a constant stress over time. So if I have some stress over time, I've only been kind of investigating what's happening if I have some constant stress amplitude um, that I'm varying over time. But then the next kind of logical question is what happens now? So this, now I would, I would have a mean stress that is not zero. Um, what would happen now if I started varying this amplitude and this mean stress? Um, so let's say I had some number n1 cycles at some mean stress, n2 cycles at another mean stress, n3 at another mean stress and stress amplitude. Um, how does this now affect failure? So this would be, I mean, this, this, is a fair, this is kind of actually what you would expect for most parts. Very rarely will you just have this kind of static cyclic loading on something. Um, it'll kind of always be varying around in time as your, as your load cycle changes, as the, I don't know, say for, a, for a, an axle in a car, if you're going at low RPM or high RPM, you're kind of cycling between some of these different states um, of stress as it vibrates. So then, how does this affect? Um, how does varying the effect of varying my stress amplitude and mean stress of varying stress A and stress M? So here now, there's actually kind of a convenient single line rule that uh, has been come up with. Let's start this out again. Uh, and it's called the Palmer Meaner rule. Palmer Meaner rule. And basically, it says I can take some di. Um, is the number of cycles cycles at some stress amplitude i and mean stress i. I know from some of my other relationships um, what my uh, what my number of cycles to failure is for a given stress amplitude and what my number of cycles to failure for a given stress amplitude and the effect of changing the mean stress on those. Um, so I can say I know the number of cycles 
to failure for stress AI and stigma MI. Um, and I can just say failure happens happens when I take some D is equal to the sum from I equals one. So this is N I over N F I uh, sum over D to M, which is the sum of I equals one M of N I over N F I when that's equal to one. So this is my Palmer Miner rule. Basically, if I know how many cycles, so so if I know how many cycles to failure at this stress, for example, um, and I hit that number of cycles, then that ratio is one, and I get failure. If I only go to half of the number of cycles to failure at this stress, then I still have, and I know the number of cycles to failure for this one. If I get to half of that, then failure happens, and kind of, so on. So it's a very simple rule. It kind of ignores a lot of a lot of the stress history of the material and it ignores how actually damage is evolving in your material, but it's still kind of a general rule of thumb for for how how to estimate the lifetime of a part for now varying life cycle or varying numbers of cycles of failure and very um, varying stress varying numbers of cycles at a given stress and amplitude and mean stress. Okay, so we have now, in, for fatigue, there's kind of three big ones. The general fatigue behavior of a material, whether there'll be th this kind of general degradation and high fatigue limit, and then whether or not there's an endurance limit for certain materials, how that changes with varying mean stress, which is the Goodman relationship, and then how that changes with varying stress cycles. Um, and so that's the Palmer Miner rule. So those are kind of our three big equations that we need for most of fatigue problems. Uh, and that can kind of give you, um, you then can take those, figure out safe limits using those factors of safety that I, that I mentioned very briefly yesterday, um, and figure out what a safe working load and working limit are for a given part. Um, I think, well, first, cool so far, questions, yeah. Are we actually going to see any of these actually used before the final? Uh, no. Awesome, cool. But I won't ask any numerical problems for fatigue. I'll ask conceptual, a, a conceptual problem. Um, yeah. So actually, this this next part is likely the thing that I'm gonna ask a question about, which is the thing that I feel is more interesting. Um, but so, so all of all of this stuff so far has been very empirical, uh, and it's kind of you do a whole bunch of tests, you get some data, you fit some curves to it, and then you come up with relations based on that, which is not, I think, the most interesting way of doing things. Um, but there is a somewhat more analytical way of looking at fatigue problems in materials. And so, um, specifically, uh, there's one relationship known as Paris's Law that looks at microstructure evolution. So, Paris is law for microstructure evolution. Um, so uh, these, these relationships here that I've been talking about, these are very useful for, from an engineering standpoint of being able to, to study and analyze parts under fatigue. And again, it's it's very important from a design standpoint to know how your part, not only that your part is going to survive 
a given a given application, but that it's going to survive over the lifetime of its application. Um, and so fatigue is how you generally think about that. But um, so this is a much more kind of interesting scientific way of looking at what's happening in fatigue. So Paris, um, not the place Paris, but this was a guy, um, actually a professor at Washington University, the other Washington um, in St. Louis. Uh, he basically in the in the 50s came up with this relationship describing how cracks grow materials under fatigue. Um, and he actually, I think, tried publishing in three different ag top academic journal, three different fatigue journals, um, and all of them rejected him. And eventually he published in his university's journal, because um, they had a the university publishing group of, for, for, university of, for Washington University. Um, and this ended up kind of taking root as one of the more interesting and important theories in fatigue. So this was something that kind of got ignored at first, but but is actually a, a very important and relevant way for looking at fatigue problems. Um, so this basically relates how fast a crack will grow for a number of cycles, uh, for a number of, um, for, for a given stress intensity. So how fast does a crack grow for given stress intensity. So now instead of just looking at the stress amplitude, specifically he started looking at the stress intensity factor. So you remember now, so this is kind of the general mechanism that we need to think about when we think about cracks uh, growing in our material. So I have some sharp crack initially, I pull on it, I pull on it and it kind of rounds out and then it grows a little bit after that cycle, delta A. So after one cycle, it'll grow some infinitesimal amount, um, particularly from metals. So this process, uh, this process of plastic, basically there's plasticity around, around the edge of this crack here, um, and that plasticity will cause it cause this crack to grow a little bit each time I stress it. Um, and so basically, in order to figure out when my part will fail, I need to figure out when my A reaches a critical length to cause fracture. And to figure out when that's going to happen, I need to relate how a certain applied stress is going to grow my crack. So that's kind of the logic behind this. So instead of looking at stress, we look at stress intensity factor, the K that we had defined for fracture, A stress intensity. Um, we can say that's some um, far field stress, uh, square root pi A, uh, generally with some geometric factor out front, depending on the loading condition. Um, but I'm gonna ignore that for this. Uh, and then I can define a, a delta K. A delta K is the change in stress um, times my square root pi A. So now I'm looking at how importantly this change in stress intensity will affect my crack growth. So I say every time I cycle it, there's gonna be some amount of plastic deformation um, for metals specifically. And that plastic deformation is gonna cause it to grow but it only causes it to grow a little bit each stress cycle. So for one cycle, it grows a little bit. For glasses and ceramics, that's not necessarily the case. Glasses and ceramics, you can kind of hold an applied stress and the crack will gradually kind of work its way out through the material. For metals, because they're plasticity limited, um, you only get kind of a finite growth generally per cycle. Um, so what, this guy was looking at, what Paris's law was looking at, is now the change in crack length, dA, for a given cycle. And so he started, so this is crack growth, growth per cycle. So he started looking at now, he, he took a whole bunch of fracture data and started plotting it out um, 
bend this a little bit. And I'm go I want to look at how big that crack grows per cycle. Um, and I'm going to look now at my delta k on my opposite axis. So there's a couple bounds in here. Um, I know that if I start hitting my KIC, fracture is going to happen. Um, so if I hit that critical stress, the same thing as my ultimate strength, I'm just going to cause the material to fail right off the bat. Um, there's actually in here, there ends up being a lower bound um, KTH where below this point, cracks don't really grow at all in the metal, so it's not enough change in stress to, to cause that plastic plastic uh, deformation growth to happen. But in between here, there's kind of a pretty broad range where, um, so at very low stress, I'm gonna get, or very low change, uh, change in, uh, in stress intensity, I'm going to get no crack growth. Uh, then there's some kind of big broad middle region and then a little tail up here where there's an asymptote where this is my critical stress. So up here, this is where fracture happens. Um, in this range, the stress is a little bit too low little too low, too low to cause crack oh, growth um, in this bound. Uh, but then all in this range, this is where Paris's law kind of takes, Paris's law kind of takes over. And so actually this, if you fit a whole bunch of experimental data, um, ends up following almost a straight line in this range. So straight line with an exponent m. So in this Paris's Law regime, I can actually just say, um, now this is, sorry, this is plotted on a log scale. Uh, log, scale, log scale for this guy and a log scale for this guy. Um, and so it turns out I can relate these two as um, dA dN is equal to some constant times my change in stress intensity factor to that exponent m. So this relationship uh, is Paris's law. So it's a really simple one. This was, again, uh, I don't know if I should say the date. This was back in the 60s, I think, early 60s, so a long time ago. But it kind of changing the way that people thought about fatigue, because up, up till that point, it had kind of just been um, take a whole bunch of fatigue data or a whole bunch of stress data and figure out where failure is going to happen and, and really empirically plot it out. Um, this kind of changed the way that people conceptualized it because now it was specifically about crack growth and fracture, which kind of intuitively, again, when, when that AC, when the, when the crack length grows to a critical crack length, then my material will fail. Um, and so really we need to figure out when that crack length grows to a certain point. And so for that, we can look at the change in stress intensity and we have Paris's law do that for us. Um, there's, I'll show now, you can directly relate that to, um, well first, uh, which one first? I'll give a few material properties and then I'll show how you can relate it. Um, so for some different materials, let's say, Material um, I have some C uh, times 10 to the minus 11 because remember cracks are very small um, so C is dimensionless K uh, is in units of 
uh, MPA root meters. Um, and then for different types of materials, uh, so for something like a steel, for an aluminum, for copper, and for titanium, <coughs> these C's are something on the order of 0 0.1, something like 4.5, around 1.3, and around 68, um, which, yes, titanium is a very high one. Uh, M's are somewhere in the order of 3 to 4. So 2.9, 3.9, and 4. Point. So these are kind of like our, our fatigue relationships. These all kind of end up being around the same point. The M here basically is defining how fast the crack is growing for a given delta K. Um, and the C is where that relationship starts being valid up in here, or where um, how, how much it'll grow per cycle. So that means uh, steel doesn't grow a lot per cycle, titanium would grow a lot per cycle. Um, yeah. So then now I can actually figure out if I start at a particular crack size, if I start at some A, I can figure out the number of cycles to failure. So I have my Paris's law, dA, dN is um, C delta K to the M, which is equal to C uh, delta sigma infinity square root of pi A to the M. So here I have an A, there I have an A. I can move some stuff around uh, to figure out how big my crack will grow uh, or how many cycles to failure I have given initial crack size. So moving things, I can now say starting at some zero to number of cycles to failure, the n, that's equal to uh, some initial crack size to some final crack size um, or generally the critical crack size. Uh, and this would be now dA over C uh, delta sigma infinity to uh, square root pi to the m. Uh, what am I missing here? dA to the m uh, over Oh, right. Um, so root a would time root a to the m would be m over 2. So this is a to the m over 2 on the bottom here. Uh, integral of dA to the m over 2. Here now I have number of cycles to failure minus 0 is equal to uh, this a. I would get a to the 1 minus m over 2 divided by m over 2 uh, times 1 over, this guy stays on the bottom, c delta sigma infinity square root pi to the m from uh, a i to a f. So then I can say my number of cycles to failure is a f 1 minus m over 2 minus a i, 1 minus m over 2, c delta sigma square root pi to the m, 1 minus m over 2. So now I can empirically say, if I know what my not to explicitly include things that um, were there in the, for the first midterm, uh, the first midterm, for the midterm, um, so this one will broadly cover topics. Um, we'll have bending, so uh, three and four point bending, um, and plasticity in beams. Um, I'll I'll talk in a sec about what 
these are, are about, uh, I don't know if I'll actually have time to go through it, but um, plasticity in beams, uh, strain gauges, buckling, 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 there we go. Um, so bending and plasticity, I'll, it was kind of on the midterm, uh, and I had one conceptual question. I'll probably have one question on bending. Um, I might have a question on strain gauges. Buckling, we spent a couple days on, uh, or a few days on, actually. Um, and I'll probably have one or two questions on buckling. Um, after buckling, we got into, what did we get into? Stress concentrations. Um, stress concentrations. So stress concentrations, specifically the hull and the plate problem. Um, so I may, I'll, I'll probably ask a question on stress concentrations. Uh, then we started looking at fracture. And so we spent a few days on fracture um, and kind of sort of continued into bits and pieces in other things. Uh, so there'll, there'll definitely be at least one question on fracture, maybe two, um, depending. Then we started talking about viscoelasticity viscoelasticity, and there'll probably be one question there. It'll either be a conceptual question, or if it is something, it'll be something on, on Maxwell's relationship, so um, if, for, if there is a numerical problem. And then uh, the last topic was fatigue. And so I'll probably have one conceptual question on fatigue, just because we, again, we haven't had, or we haven't actually had time to or to, to dig through any problems and there's no homework sets on it and there's no labs on it. Um, there may be a conceptual question on this Charpy lab, so the ductal to brittle transition. Ductal to brittle uh, energy absorption. Um, yeah. And I think that this is kind of the big set of things that we've covered since the midterm. Uh, so you had a buckling lab and a bending lab. So hopefully those are more familiar. You saw the Charpy lab. You didn't actually do much of the analysis. But for those of you who attended, hopefully you have a little bit of an understanding of that. Um, and then we did a stress concentration lab. Um, so. I guess tomorrow, because uh, so tomorrow will be the last lecture. I'll just kind of go through a final review for the first thirty, the first thirty-five minutes of class, and then I'll have the the final course eval at the end, um, which again would be really useful if you're if you stick around for the lab. Thanks.